Hello, I am Sam Smith, and this is Sam's MCAT Basics. This podcast covers the most important topics put out on the AAMC MCAT each year, and I determine this list by going through all the official practice materials that the AAMC puts out, and also some third-party practice material, and just put together this big list of topics that consistently kept on showing up, and um, ranked those topics and um, made podcasts out of it. All right, so this lecture is going to cover a bunch of different topics related to learning. So what I'm going to do first is go through different parts of the brain that are associated with learning and talk about how these all work together to to store bits of information and process them and kind of what takes place during learning. And this will include a little bit of talk on memory. And then I'm going to talk about different types of learning in terms of uh, latent learning, observational learning, um, which are types of non-associative learning. And then lastly, I'll talk about operant and classical conditioning, which are types of associative learning. And this kind of sounds like two different topics, but it it really is kind of, they're, they're tied to the same thing. They're both tied to learning. And you will see this material on one out of the four sections. That will be the psych soch section of the MCAT, and I, I promise that you will see something on conditioning. There will be some kind of either classical conditioning, operant conditioning, or probably both, to be honest. That's a huge um, topic on the MCAT. Um, so yeah, hope hope this helps. Hope you enjoy. So psychologists often define learning as a relatively permanent change in behavior as a result of some experiment. So in order for us to be able to learn, we basically got to take in information, we got to store that information in our brains that, that relates to some certain stimuli. And so these are called memories. And they are what allows us to learn. And I'm not going to go deep into detail on how learning works in terms of changes in uh, neuroplasticity and neurotransmitters. I, I don't really understand that, first of all, and I don't really think you have to for the MCAT. What I am going to talk about is what I think is the most important part of uh, learning in the brain, which is the structures in the brain that deal with the learning and memory and the different types of memory. Again, um, learning and memory are very interconnected Think about those two concepts being very tied together. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about here is memory. So let's start by talking about the information processing model of memory. It essentially suggests that our brains take in information about our surroundings and store that information in a similar manner as like a calculator, right? We get inputs, our brain processes them, and then we spit out outputs in terms of our behavior. And of course, this is conceptual only because our, our brains are very complex and, you know, it's not necessarily that we see something, process, and then output. You know, we, we're obviously not computers. Um, so that is just the information processing model is something that is conceptual only. So there are a few different types of memory to know. The first is sensory memory, and this is the shortest term element of memory. It's the ability to retain impressions of sensory information after the original stimuli has ended. So it kind of acts as a buffer for the stimuli received through the five senses, and those are sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch, which are retained very accurately, but for a very brief period of time. And there are a few different types of sensory memories. There's echoic which is auditory stimuli, and this lasts for about three seconds. And then you have iconic, which is visual stimuli, and this is less than the echoic. It it only lasts for about half a second. And then we have haptic, which is touch memory. And so just a quick aside, why do you think it is that the smell of grandma's pumpkin pie elicits such a strong emotion? Well, one theory says that the smells get routed through our olfactory bulb, which is the region of the brain that deals with analyzing smells. And this is very closely connected to the amygdala and hippocampus, which I'm going to talk about in a bit. 
but just know that those regulate uh, memory and emotion. So the theory there is that because the olfactory bulb is so close to the amygdala, that when you stimulate that olfactory bulb, you are also somehow partially stimulating the amygdala, which is why you get kind of an emotional response to the smell of, you know, grandma's pumpkin pie. All right, the next type of memory I want to talk about is called working memory. And in working memory, you can keep seven plus or minus two pieces of information stored at a time. And you really want to memorize the seven plus or minus two. You might see that at some point. And working memory is basically what allows you to do mental math. So think about this as being able to keep seven bits of information in your brain at once and being able to manipulate them, add, subtract, do whatever you need to do, and then um, put out some output. And just another quick aside um, about working memory is that you, you might be thinking about taking an Adderall before the MCAT. And so it might sound like an attractive idea. However, it has been shown that Adderall actually impairs working memory and therefore does not necessarily improve test performance. It's good for studying, though, right? It improves your attention to the materials. It improves how long you can go between breaks. That's all great. So Adderall, good for studying, but bad for performance. Basically the opposite of Viagra. And often you will hear short-term memory substituted in for working memory. That's not correct. So short-term memory is where information is stored by the working memory. Um, so short-term memory is essentially the vessel by which the working memory operates. It's kind of like Microsoft is to a blank computer. Again, working memory describes the process by which you modulate these different bits of information within, within the short-term memory. So let's talk next about long-term memory. And long-term memory is a place where information is stored long-term. And this is for more than just a few minutes. There are a few different types of long-term memory that you should know for the MCAT. These are broken down into explicit memory and implicit memory. Explicit or declarative memory are memories that you can consciously recall from the long-term memory. And then implicit memories in the, in the long-term memory are memories that are unconsciously recalled. And so for an example, you know, explicit memories are memories of trips to certain places. You know, let's say you went to the Bahamas in fifth grade and you remember how great the beach was. Implicit memories, on their hand, are things like riding a bike or running, things that you don't have to consciously think about what you're doing while you're doing it. And explicit and implicit can be broken down even further. So explicit memories can be broken down into declarative memory, which are facts and events, and declarative memory can be further broken down into episodic and semantic memories. Episodic memories are events from the past. So again, remember your trip to the Bahamas. And semantic memories are knowledge gained throughout life. So you can remember, you know, what you're doing right now, what you're studying. That's knowledge gained throughout your life. Memorizing the amino acid structures, stuff like that. That is semantic memory. Episodic memory, on the other hand, is events. And you can, it's pretty easy to remember, right? Episodic, episode, you can kind of remember it that way. Episodes throughout your life. On the other hand, you have implicit memory, and there's two different types of implicit memory to know. There's procedural memory, and this is things like riding your bike, driving your car, procedures that you can remember um, unconsciously. And then there's also priming. So priming is the exposure to a stimulus that influences response to a later stimulus. So an example from my life is loud TV commercials. So first of all, loud TV commercials are really annoying and obnoxious. And I think there was one for State Farm, I believe, nonetheless so I'm watching TV all of a sudden the commercials come on it gets super loud and I get kind of pissed off and it's a state farm I, for whatever reason every time it's a state farm commercial so now anytime I'm walking around in real life I see state farm I get a little bit pissed off inside and so you can think of that as a priming stimulus right that stimulus now causes me to act or, or get annoyed when I see the state farm in real life so loud TV commercials primed me to have an annoyed response each time I saw State Farm 
advertisement anywhere else in my life. All right, to briefly summarize, memory breaks down into two main categories. That's explicit and implicit. Explicit are conscious memories. Implicit are unconscious. And then explicit breaks down further into episodic memory, which is based on episodes from your past life or from this life, just episodes in the past, and also semantic memories, which are knowledge gained through life. And together, episodic and semantic memory are known as declarative memory. And then implicit further breaks down into procedural memory and priming memory. All right, now that I've covered the different types of memory, let's get into a few different brain structures involved in learning and memory. Before I start talking about the structures that underlie memory within the brain, let's get a brief understanding of how memory works. Well, what are, what are the underlying principles there? So there are three main principles of uh, memory. The first is encoding, the second is storage, and the third is retrieval. Encoding refers to the process through which information is learned, that's to say, essentially how information is taken in, understood, and altered to be able to be stored inside your brain. So that's encoding. Um, and so you can think of this as like you're sitting, watching a lecture, your teacher's talking, you're taking in auditory information, you're taking in visu visual stimulation, you know, maybe your teacher has a PowerPoint, uh, they're showing you, they're flipping through slides, you're looking at it, and you're listening. And you're putting these bits of information into your brain. You're, they are, these bits of information are being encoded into your brain. The second part of memory is storage. And so storage refers to how, where, and um, how long these bits of information are, are encoded or stored within the memory system. And the third step in learning and memory is retrieval. And retrieval is the process through which individuals access stored information and then use that information to either make decisions or base their behavior on that stored information. So you have to have some response to the stored information that you have. Um, you know, you learn, for instance, you're in class, you learned last Thursday that, um, you know, the thyroid hormone thyroxidine increases metabolic rate. And so, you, you know, you have that, you encoded that stored that away in your long-term memory, and then now you have to retrieve that now when you're taking a test, and, you know, it asks you what the T3 hormone does. All right, so let's get into the different structures within the brain that are related to learning and memory. All right, so there are four main parts of the brain that play a role in memory. The first is the amygdala, the second is the prefrontal cortex, the third is the hippocampus, and the fourth is the cerebellum. All right, so let's start with the role of the amygdala. If you remember from the nervous system podcast, you'll remember that the amygdala plays a big role in emotion. And it has a two kind of main roles in terms of memory. The first is that it helps encode memories. And so you can kind of think about it this way. So it's, it's, it's responsible for regulating emotion. So what happens when you come upon a, some kind of situation in which you have an emotional response? Let's say, um, you know, the boogeyman's coming to get you and you get kind of scared. Well, now you help, you are helping encode the boogeyman with fear. And so now um, you can put that memory into your long-term memory, right? You can encode that with fear. And the next time that stimulus is presented, you will have a fear response, right? You learned to fear the boogeyman. This is also a process called fear conditioning. And so the other way that the amygdala helps regulate learning and memory is it helps consolidate memories from short-term memory into long-term memory. So it plays a role in memory consolidation. So again, the two things to think about in terms of learning and memory that go along with the amygdala are, number one, that it helps encode memories. You can think about the fear response. And then it also helps consolidate memories. All right, so the next structure is called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is mainly known to 
take memories from the short-term memory and consolidate them into long-term memories. So it plays a role in maintaining um, and establishing long-term memories. Next is the prefrontal cortex. And so the prefrontal cortex plays a role in short-term memory and working memory. You can think of working memory as the kind of memory that you would use for mental math. So, you know, you have bits of information and you're kind of manipulating them in your head. So the prefrontal cortex plays a big role in both short-term and working memory. The last structure that I want to talk about in terms of memory is the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is known to regulate procedural memory. And so again, procedural memory is memories that can be recalled unconsciously and you know be applied to some task. So this is something like riding a bike. Right? You're not kind of actively remembering how to ride a bike each time you do it. That's stored in your procedural memory, which then um, can be which then can be unconsciously drawn upon in order to complete that task. All right, so that was a brief overview of four important structures in terms of learning and memory. The next thing I want to talk about is learning. So I'll get into different types of learning and then talk about conditioning. So there are three types of learning I want to talk about. The first is latent learning, then observational learning, and then conditioning. So I'm going to go get deep, deep into the weeds on conditioning. I'll kind of briefly touch on the first two. So latent learning is a form of learning that is not immediately expressed in an overt response. So it, it essentially, this learning occurs without any reinforcement of the behavior or association. And so the classic example is that you take a mouse, you carry it through a maze a few times, and then you put that mouse into the maze, and you put cheese or some other stimuli at the end of the maze, and the mouse will actually complete that maze faster than a mouse who was not carried through the maze. In other words, that mouse learned how to go through that maze without actually doing it, right? They observed how to go through the maze, how to get to the other side, and then they applied that learning. And it's important here that I mentioned that you do this unconsciously, right? The mouse wasn't thinking, oh, hey, they're going to put me in here with cheese and I'm going to be able to get here faster, right? The mouse is just chilling and kind of looking around and observing. They are not actively trying to learn. The next type of learning is called observational learning. And this is learning by watching. And this applies more to social learning. Right? You watch your friend do behavior X, and then you do behavior X. And this is distinct from latent learning because this requires you to actually concentrate and actively learn. In latent learning, you're just chilling, just kind of looking, and you're not actually trying to learn. But in this case, observational learning is you are watching a behavior occur, and you're actively saying, oh, that's something I want to do. That's a behavior I want to pick up. All right, let's talk about conditioning. And again, this is probably the most important part of this podcast for the MCAT. There are two different types of conditioning. There is classical conditioning and there is operant conditioning. Classical conditioning, which is also known as Pavlovian conditioning, is learning through association and was first discovered by Pavlov, who was a Russian physiologist. You may remember him as the dog guy from psych class. And what he did is he conditioned dogs to respond to a bell, and that would make them salivate. And so classical conditioning involves learning to associate an unconditioned stimulus that already brings about some response. And this is called an unconditioned response with a new conditioned stimulus that brings about that same response. And here's how it works. So first you start with a stimulus that produces some sort of response. Let's take the following example. When you smell pizza, you automatically get hungry and your mouth waters, right? So in this case, the stimulus is the pizza and the response is your mouth waters. So this is the unconditioned stimulus, which is pizza, and the unconditioned response, which is your mouth waters. Now let's take that unconditioned stimulus and unconditioned response and pair it with a conditioned stimulus. 
So let's say this is you receiving a text and your iPhone makes that little ding noise. This noise by itself is a neutral stimulus, i.e. It doesn't, it doesn't produce a response just by itself. But let's just say you eat so much pizza that the only texts you get are the text to tell you that your pizza's here. Hey, your pizza's here. Now eventually it gets to a point where each time you hear, your mouth starts watering because you know that your pizza's getting here. Now, let's say that for all of a sudden, it's uh, spring break. Spring break! And you decide to go on a little diet. So you tell yourself, you know, I'm not going to eat any more pizza. I'm going to lose a few pounds, whatever. But now, you get a text, and it's from your mom. However, immediately after you get that text, your mouth waters, right? Because you still have that connection that uh, connects that text message to pizza. And eventually, though... This keeps happening, you start to realize that, okay, this noise doesn't necessarily mean that there's pizza. And so what happens is you get an, an extinction of the conditioned response. That response goes away. However, let's say that it's been a few days and you're like, shit, I'm giving this up. Um, I don't, you know, my, my body's fine for spring break. I don't need to go on this diet anymore. And so you order pizza. And, of course, you hear the... Hey, your pizza's here! And this time, of course, your pizza is actually there. And what happens is you have a spontaneous recovery of the conditioned behavior. You know, maybe after one or two of these pizzas you order, the mouth-watering effect of your text message tone comes back. And so that's important to note is that a lot of times you'll have a spontaneous recovery of the conditioned behavior. So let's quickly go over these terms again, just so you really have them drilled down. So the unconditioned stimulus is a stimulus that elicits or triggers a response that is innate or happens naturally, right? And it, it doesn't need practice or training to occur. And the response that an unconditioned stimulus elicits is called the unconditioned response. On the other hand, a conditioned stimulus is an initially neutral stimulus that becomes able to elicit a new response when it reliably predicts an unconditioned stimulus. And lastly, the conditioned response is the response that the conditioned stimulus triggers. So that is a brief introduction into classical conditioning. Very important to know. Know the difference between all these terms and how to apply them to real life situations, especially when it is Spring break. and you want pizza. All right, so next let's talk about operant conditioning. So operant conditioning was developed by B.F. Skinner, which in itself is a it's honestly kind of a horrible sounding name. However, it's a method of learning that occurs through rewards and punishments. And Skinner identified three types of responses that can follow behavior. So these are also called operants. So when you hear operant, just think of response. So there are neutral operants, and these are responses from the environment that neither increase nor decrease the probability of behavior being repeated. You also have reinforcers which are responses from the environment that increase the probability of a behavior being repeated. And reinforcers can either be positive or negative. And then he also noticed that punishers um, had the ability to modulate behavior. So punishers are responses from the environment that decrease the likelihood of behavior being repeated. And it's important to note that punishment weakens behavior some any, any type of behavior. It weakens the behavior that you would like it to weaken. And it is important to note that there is both positive and negative punishment. So let's go over each of these and kind of talk about what they mean. So we'll start with reinforcement, positive and negative. So positive reinforcement is something you add to increase a behavior. On the other hand, negative reinforcement is when you remove something to increase a behavior. Then you have positive punishments, which is something that you add to decrease behavior. 
Uh, and the, the last one is negative punishment, which is removing something to decrease behavior. So let's give examples of these from the perspective of a parent. So the example of a positive reinforcement would be giving your kid candy for acting good or doing well on a test. On the other hand, negative reinforcement would be something like taking your kid's phone away in order for them to do their homework, right? You're removing some kind of stimulus or some kind of, you're removing something in order for them to increase their behavior. Then you would have po uh, positive punishment. So that could be something like giving them a beating. Just kidding, don't do that. But that would be positive punishment. And then lastly, for negative punishment, this would be taking away your kid's phone in order for them to stop acting like a jackass. So again, that's taking away something to decrease behavior. That is a negative punishment. So the classic experiment that Skinner performed was done in these boxes called Skinner boxes. So Skinner boxes were essentially these enclosed boxes where he would keep mice and rats. And what he would have them do is he'd have them respond to some stimulus, usually a light or even electric shock, and they would have to press a lever. And then in return for pressing that lever, when they saw the stimulus, they would receive some kind of reward, usually in the form of food. And so in doing this, he tested out a bunch of different reinforcement schedules. So let's go into these different reinforcement schedules. There are five different types of reinforcement schedules. There is continuous reinforcement. There is fixed ratio and variable ratio reinforcement. And then there is interval variable and interval fixed schedules. So we'll go through all five of these. Before I get into these reinforcement schedules, I want to briefly mention two measures of how good a schedule is. So the first one is response rate, which in the case I'm about to present is the rate at which the lever was pressed, or how many responses per time occurs. And so obviously if you have more responses per time, that is going to be considered a better schedule. The second variable is extinction. So this is essentially how quickly a behavior um, is gone after reinforcement has been stopped. So in the case of these mice or these rats, this is how long it took the rats to stop pressing the lever after the reward, i.e. food, was stopped. So in this case, the longer it takes for a behavior to go extinct, the better the reinforcement schedule is. A long time for a behavior to go extinct is also known as a low extinction rate. Kind of confusing. So the first reinforcement schedule to know is continuous reinforcement. So let's go back to the mouse example. So in continuous reinforcement schedule, the mouse is positively reinforced every time they press the lever. So every single time they, they press the lever. And so this schedule results in a very slow response rate, right? Because they know that every time they press it, they're going to get it. So they don't really have to have a fast response. And it is also very prone to a high extinction rate. This will go extinct very fast. The next type of schedule of reinforcement I want to talk about is called a fixed ratio reinforcement. So this is when behavior is reinforced only after the behavior occurs a specific number of times. So for example, let's say you are given one treat for every fifth push down of the lever. And so in this case, the response rate is typically fast. They'll go and hit the button a bunch of times and then they'll get that treat. And the extinction rate is about medium. So this can go extinct and not quite as easily as the continuous reinforcement. The next schedule is called fixed interval reinforcement. And so this is when one reinforcement is given after a fixed time interval, providing at least one correct response has been made. So this is essentially that the mouse gets one treat every five minutes, regardless of how many 
times they hit that lever. And of course, they have to hit it once, but that's it. And so this has a medium response rate and a medium extinction rate, meaning it's, it's an okay um, reinforcement schedule. It's, it's okay. The next type of reinforcement is called variable ratio reinforcement. So this is when behavior is reinforced after an unpredictable number of times. So this is when, you know, it, it happens completely randomly. So say the mouse hits it three times one time and then they get a treat. The next time the mouse is going to hit it 18 times. So it's completely random in how many of times you need to hit that lever in order to get a treat back. And this works the best in terms of um, response rate and extinction rate. It has a very fast response rate and a very low or slow extinction rate. Um, it's, it's very hard to extinguish because of its unpredictability. And the last schedule is called a variable interval schedule of reinforcement. And this essentially says that provided that one correct response has been made, reinforcement is given after an unpredicted amount of time. So, you know, this is the example that provided that the mouse have hit the lever at least once, that they'll be given a treat every X amount of time, right? And X changes through time. So in, at, ra at random time intervals, they're given these treats if they hit the lever at least once. So you can think about it this way. Ratio refers to the reinforcement itself and when it's given. And v interval refers to time. So that's time between being given a reinforcement. And ratio is how often the behavior has to occur in order to receive a reinforcement. And the last term I want to mention that goes along with operant conditioning is called shaping. And so shaping occurs when over successive periods of time, you eventually get to some behavior through operant conditioning. In other words, shaping is the process of reinforcing successively closer and closer approximations of a desired behavior till you reach that behavior. So an example would be potty training your kid, right? So not that I've ever done this, but what I'm guessing happens, and I'm pretty sure, I, I really don't really know what you do with kids, but I do know that you have to potty train them. And so what I'm guessing happens is, okay, go poop in the grass over here. And so your kid poops in the grass over there, and you give them a doggy biscuit. And so after that occurs, you tell them, okay, now poop in this little cup that I brought outside. Okay, cool. They do that. You give them another doggy biscuit. And then eventually what happens is you, you know, next time maybe you take one of those little portable kid toilets outside and you say, okay, now let's poop in this. And they do and they get all excited. You give them a high five, whatever. Now the next time you say, all right, let's try this inside on your little training toilet. And they'll say, okay, let's do it. And then they do it. And then eventually what happens is you get closer and closer and closer to them going to the bathroom on the actual porcelain toilet inside. And eventually you get there through shaping and through reinforcement of these little behaviors that get you closer and closer and closer to that end behavior. All right, and so that wraps up operant conditioning. And so what you really need to know essentially here is how to recognize what is a positive and negative reinforcement and then also a positive and negative punishment and also be able to identify different schedules of reinforcement. And those are really the two big things, okay? So know how to do that. Know what you're likely going to see is they'll give you some passage and say what kind of reinforcement was given in this. Was it a positive reinforcement? Was it a negative reinforcement? Was it some kind of punishment? So you really need to be able to identify those in, in passages um, in, in questions when you're asked. All right, and that concludes the Learning and Memory podcast. I hope this helps you in your studying, and good luck to those of you who are taking the MCAT very soon. I know we're getting close to that season, so good luck if you are. Um, 
If you like the podcast, go ahead and give it a review. I like it, whatever you got to do. I appreciate you listening, and I hope you listen to the next one. All right, so now time for the MCAT advice of the day. So today I want to briefly mention, and this kind of applies to you, those of you who are taking the MCAT very soon. Um, in the last few days before you take the MCAT, you know, maybe a day or two before, give yourself a day off and really just kind of, if, if possible, let your mind kind of wander away from it. Because what's going to happen is it's going to be pretty hard to fall asleep the night before, right? At least it was for me because I was pretty pumped. I was pretty psyched. I was ready to take it and get it over with. But because of that, you can kind of psych yourself out. And so what I think is pretty important is the day before, you know, make sure that you relax, maybe get a good workout in so you'll sleep better. Kind of try to get your mind away from the MCAT because the next day is going to be, you know, it's going to be do or die. So my advice to you is take a day or two off before the MCAT, relax, let yourself kind of recover. And then that way when you are taking the MCAT, you're completely focused and fresh. Sam's MCAT Basics is written, produced, and recorded by Murph the Dog. Uh, Special thanks to Murph the Dog for this episode.